This is a tape of the three sermons by Father Charles E. Coughlin at Old St. Mary's in Detroit, June 8th, 9th, and 10th, 1973. Reverend Fathers, ladies and gentlemen, I consider this a rare privilege to come to Old St. Mary's. In these hallowed walls dwelt the Franciscan Fathers at one time, the Jesuit Fathers for a while, and last but not least, the Holy Ghost Fathers. The Holy Ghost Fathers have been very intimate with me during my life as a priest. For about 25 to 30 years, they were my assistants at the shrine with the diocesan clergy and the Franciscans. There were seven to nine of us there at all the time that I held tenure as pastor. Those were the days when The vast shrine with its 3,000 and more seating capacity had at least 1,500 persons there every weekday morning for Mass. Those were the days when a novena to the Holy Ghost found persons standing in the aisles. Those were the days when the priests worked so hard. We had two schools. The Franciscan Fathers, the secular priests, and the Holy Ghost Fathers taught three days a week, seven of them at least, in both our schools. I heard confessions at an average of three hours every day. They distributed Holy Communions to more than 10,000 persons every week. What glorious days there were in this diocese. My intimate was Tom Rogers a Holy Ghost Father, and Florence Hoste, a Franciscan Father. They were there longest. They lived upstairs. We were together many hours every day. And I felt I lived with two saints together with the other priests. They're both in heaven now. And so, in memory of those glorious days and in memory of the dead Tom Rogers who is now in heaven, Florence Hoste, I'm here to say thank you to them and to God for having given me the companionship of those men. Now about the Holy Spirit. That is the purpose of my visit here for these three days for 15 minutes a day, maybe a little longer on Sunday. You know the story of the Blessed Trinity. You know as much as we can know about the three persons in one God, one infinite, invisible sub substance, three persons not sharing the substance of one-third each. The mystery is the infinite substance is in each person or each person is the infinite substance. Don't try to understand. But you see, it was God the Father who created this vast universe of ours. And in my estimation, he has been creating from all eternity. 
It's laughable to hear these modern scientists say the Earth is 10 billion years old. Jupiter is 50 billion years old. Arcturus may be 100 billion years old. It's laughable to hear them say that. It shows they do not know the essence of God. From all eternity, God has been creating. Creating what? I don't know. All I do know is he has been creating materialities, such as the earth. All I do know, he has been creating spiritualities, such as the angels. And all I do know, that he has been creating an in-between called human beings. Part earth, part spirit. It was Aristotle who said man is a rational animal. And it was St. Bonaventure who added, yes, rational one-tenth of the time and animal nine-tenths of the time. But God the Father created this beautiful earth. He revealed himself in it. It's all we do know. He revealed himself in the written word of God, which is the Bible, which in my estimation is even secondary to the earth in one sense. Because this book of the earth with its flowers and its fields and its rivers and mountains, this book of the earth with its minuscule animals, from the microbe to the mighty elephant, this grand earth with its sunrise and sunset and its fields and valleys and with its living creatures, and the providential God supplying all of us with the means of sustenance is a book to be studied, a book to be loved, a book to be admired. Don't take it for granted. That's God the Father, the Creator, who gave it to us and who gave us those innumerable, incalculable planets and galaxies, we will have eternity to explore them. Eternity to explore them. Where does God the Holy Ghost come in this? Schemata of the Blessed Trinity. Well, God the Holy Spirit has always been on earth, has always been in Arcturus and the Pleiades, has always been in the further stretches of the universe beyond which human calculation can never comprehend. It was he, the God of beauty, as Christ is the God of truth and God the Father, the God of power and on omniscience, it is He, the Holy Spirit, who grew the little blade of grass, crimsoned the beautiful rose, filled the air with the singing birds, it's he who gilds the fields with the golden wheat. It's he who multiplies beyond calculation the waters of the oceans with fish and living creatures. The God of creation, the God of life, the God of beauty, why yes, it was he Form the work of creation within Mary's body. He who made her pregnant. He who filled her womb with a living human intellect and will and body and soul of the 
little Jesus Christ. It's he who visited every one of you mothers and wedlock to have you cooperate with him in the creation of life. Well, what about this God, the Holy Spirit? Fifteen minutes on this. When Christ came on earth, he came here, as we all know, to do one terrific thing. To appease Almighty God for the sins of the world. And secondly, to redeem and save us. Secondarily, secondarily, not primary, not primary. Primary to appease Almighty God by the sins persons committed against Him. The lowest kind of person called a man, the highest kind of person called an angel, the satanic angels, who likewise sin. And Christ came here a divine person to offer up his life for the sins not of the earth, but for the sins of the world. And the world takes in every fallen angel as as well as every fallen man. Where does the Holy Ghost come? Well, this poor divine Jesus Christ, the object of our pity at times, spent his life proving that he was God, spent his life proving that he was divine truth, spent his life doing for us what ten million years probably had proven men could not do for themselves, could not eradicate poverty and disease and crime and hell, could not eradicate death and the tomb of time. Christ came here, I repeat, to do for us through his death and resurrection and his gospel and his sacraments and his church what history proved men were incapable of doing for themselves. And how did it end? It ended by his being assassinated. It ended by his being put to death by perjurers. It ended by these people whom he had befriended standing there in Pilate's hall saying that he consorted with adulteresses, saying that he was no friend of Caesar, saying that he was no friend of God, saying after he had cured their sick, lifted their dead to life, give us Barabbas away with Christ. Where does the Holy Ghost come in? Prior to his ascension into heaven, Christ gathered his apostles about him and said, it's the best thing for you gentlemen that I go. For if I go not, I will not be able to send the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, who will do three things. Convict the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. Turn over the findings of Pilate's court of Herod's court and of that lying, miserable court of Annas and Caiaphas, the heretical church of the God-given Jews. So Christ departed. He sent the Holy Spirit here, the God of beauty, the God of creation of the world, 
on a special mission to do these three things under the title of paraclete. Now, this is the first time in the New Testament that we find a Greek word of boy, paraclete. Christ employed it. And what does it mean in classical Greek? The best way I know how to translate it is prosecuting attorney. He sent the Holy Spirit here to overturn the findings of those three courts. Men said we can get along without God. All we need is Caesar. Men said that we can get along with God. And his grace, all we need is our own power, our own intellect, our own will. Men can get along without peace of a heavenly nature. All we need to do to banish war is hold our councils, hold our meetings, sign a peace treaty of Versailles or a peace treaty of Vietnam or some other ridiculous phase of life written by liars and cowards and atheists as if it could be better than them. The Holy Ghost now, don't forget why he's here. Christ in the meantime is out on bail, if I may use an American word. He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, awaiting for the Holy Spirit to accomplish his mission as paraclete. But a prosecuting attorney, my dear friends, can't win a case in court, as any attorney here knows, without witnesses, without evidence. I don't care how smart he is. He can't win without facts, without witnesses. And the Holy Spirit in establishing this church. He didn't found the church. Christ founded the church. That's the foundation. But the Holy Spirit established it, built the walls, put on the roof, excogitated the liturgies, materialized and factualized the sacraments, so that when a priest raises his hand in confession, it's the Holy Spirit that raises his hand. When a priest pours the water, it's the Holy Spirit who pours the water. When a priest consecrates the host, it's the Holy Spirit who empowers his lips and his heart and his mind to say, this is my body, not your body, but my body, acting in the name of Christ. wrong with the witnesses today. I'll give you an idea of what's wrong. Just this morning, I got this clipping from Boston. The once famous Boston pilot. The most famous Catholic weekly newspaper we had. And I read an editorial from its editor. Just this morning, it was written June and the editor, Right Reverend Monsignor George W. Casey, says this. Despite the fact that the Communist Party is practically non-existent in the United States, and the Communist conspiracy hardly more than a bad dream, the conspiracy is still a word to conjure with, with anti-communism. When it was pounded so needlessly, into the consciousness by Charles E. Coughlin, Fulton Sheen, J. Edgar Hoover, Joseph McCarthy, and he left out some other names, Leo the Thirteenth, Pius XI, Pius the Twelfth, and the greatest of all living saints, Cardinal Minsanti. Casey, with his purple robe, doesn't know enough to put their names in. And that's what's wrong with the Catholic Church today. That's what's wrong with the witness.
campuses today. There are water gators. They've gone over to the other side by their silence. And until we're aroused, until we realize the difference between communism and Christianity, one, the materialistic concept of life, the other, the spiritual concept of life, one, adopting what Christ says, you are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And the other which says, to hell with Christ, let's crucify him and his fighting, and let's surrender. That's all for today on the Holy Spirit. Be good witnesses and don't follow men like Monsignor Casey. You'll go to hell if you do. Father Charles Coughlin, June 9th, Old St. Mary's. Ladies and gentlemen, let us offer this 15 minutes of meditation to Almighty God for the sins of the world particularly our own sins. Yesterday I made the announcement that your battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against, not against Nazism. It's not against Judaism. It's not against Mohammedanism. It's not against Democrats. It's not against men. Your battle is not against flesh and blood. Was the universal statement Christ made. He added, it is against powers and principalities, meaning the greatest of all the angels who are fallen, not just the ordinary minor angel, but the greatest of all the fallen angels. And secondly, it is against powers and principalities and rulers dwelling in high places. It's against your rulers. Not all your rulers, but rulers dwelling in high places. This morning I wish to talk about Antichrist. Much superstition exists amongst Catholics and others about the identity of Antichrist. There's only one Antichrist. That's Satan. Only one. Just the same as there's one Holy Spirit, there is one unholy spirit who is the leader of the battalion now engaged in mortal conflict. When you were a little boy, a little girl, you were brought to church to be confirmed. You recollect what we read in the epistle relative to the Mass on the Holy Spirit which it is my privilege to offer every Wednesday of the week, no matter what comes up, except a first-class feast. One 
day the apostles were gathered shortly after the ascension of Christ. They were holding a conference, and they happened to mention something about the new Christians in Samaria. It was mentioned that they had been baptized. And Peter asked the assembled the apostles, By the way, have you ever confirmed these people? Oh, no. So a decision was made at this conference of the apostles to send two apostles down to Samaria to confirm the baptized Christians there. And this peculiar remark is in the Testament. They had only been baptized. They had not yet received the Holy Spirit. That's startling, isn't it? You see, baptism doesn't give you everything. They had only been baptized, are the words of the Scripture. They had not yet received the Holy Spirit. So, John were commissioned by the apostles to visit Samaria and confirm these gentlemen and ladies. I make note of that. talk about Antichrist. You see, the Holy Spirit is not working directly at all times in this great battle that is now in progress. It would be almost beneath his dignity to stand down on the battlefield face to face with a creature of his, no matter how potent he may be, and fight with him, this creature who rebelled against God through pride, thinking that he was as great as God, must suffer the most devastating illusion. the Holy Ghost plan that you and I stand off there face to face. The policy of the Holy Spirit that the mystical body of Christ all people who are firm to be to that mystic body should do the battling. How does Satan battling? Is he face to face with us? Oh, not necessarily. One day Christ was accosted by some of who sought his relief. Others there was who was evidently possessed by the devil. Specifications of his activities were not announced in the New Testament, but Christ expelled the devil from this poor person, human being. And he says, what's your name? And the devil who was expelled from the poor person says, my name is Legion. Legion. A good Latin derivative word. We use something similar to it in English when we say, thanks a million. The man was simply saying, my name is a multitude, a multitude, an uncountable multitude. In other words, then, the two armies on earth now engaged in mortal conflict. Won the army of the Holy Spirit, not the army of Christ. I didn't say that. That wouldn't be good knowledge. The army of the Holy Spirit, of the third person of the Blessed Trinity, who is down on earth officially taking 
the place of Christ, who once was here officially, but not here anymore, officially. He's here sacramentally, and sacrificially, but not officially. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. That's where Christ is. The Holy Ghost who he sent here to convict the world of sin, justice and judgment, is he who is here officially to do those three things among all the other functions he enjoys. How does he do it? Through the sacrament of confirmation, which is so Minimized by Catholics today. Minimized by Catholic prelates. Minimized by Catholic laity. In fact, the Holy Spirit is practically expelled from our Catholic universities. He is fully expelled. The doctrines of Father de Chardin, who is the new Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for all the heresy of today. No Holy Spirit according to them. I heard a Jesuit priest from Fem University tell me that's the fiction of the imagination. This Holy Spirit business. It's a fiction of hell. The mystical body of Satan. One army, the mystical body of Christ is the second army, and members of the mystical body of Christ are the confirmandi. You are a member. Just as the same as the soldier has been inducted in the army of the United States, says farewell to his father and mother or his wife and children, just the same as off the armament of civilization, and the abilities of civilization don the clothing of a soldier, just as he forsakes his home, his culture, his comfort, and lives in the dirt, and eats the inferior food, and faces the bullet. You confirmand, I better wake up and do that. so many things to say on this point that I haven't time to cover it all in 15 minutes. But what's wrong with the Catholic Church today? And there's a lot wrong with it. Don't try to cover it up. Don't try to ban your cancer. Is the ungodly desertion from the banner of the Holy Spirit that has been in vogue for many centuries. And we have more deserters today than we have soldiers under arms. Who is that, I guess? That's why I'm here today to tell you that. Before I go further, though, I again insist that my name is Legion. In ancient days, probably the Medes and Persians were the Antichrist. You see, the Jews were the only people, the only race that had been selected by God to hold the covenant of the truth. During this long, long session, when Christ, according to the Apocalypse, tells us, as does the Spirit, that the devil was unchained, that's the word that's used, unchained, to roam the face of the earth, to rise the firmament, to destroy our curse, to destroy Orion, to cause chaos. were made to the image and likeness of God. 
following the whole Halloween. All those peoples from that time down to the Medes and Persians, possibly the Egyptians became the Antichrist. And after Christ's time, definitely ex-Christians, treacherous Christians became the Antichrist under the leadership of a man named Arius. And Arianism, you know your history, gradually flourished into the 7th century Mohammedanism. And after that, other Antichrists came. The Storians. And following down through the dark Middle Ages, still Antichrists came after Charlemagne and the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman. And following that, we came down to the explosion of Lutheranism, Antichrist. And following that, we came down to the explosion of the Caden under Schopenhauer and the rest of those naturalists. And that lasted down through the days until Leo the Thirteenth wrote his most marvelous of all encyclicals written by a holy Roman Pope. The human of the other encyclical that any Pope ever wrote. 1898. And he rather summarized the whole story in there. by this encyclical which damned naturalism. A naturalist is an antichrist. One who thinks of the perfectibility of the human race through man's own prowess, man's own power, man's own science, he's an antichrist. Because there is no such thing as naturalism. Let's call it by its right name. Born naturalism. Not one of us has healthy eyes. Not one of us has healthy ears. Not one of us has healthy intestines. Not one of us has a healthy mind. Nature about us has grown its thorns and thistles since the rebellion of Cain and Abel. Thorns and thistles being a poetic word for saying volcanoes, earthquakes, storms, cancer, disease, war, hatred, hell on earth. Satan let loose, deceiving people to be natural. thing in existence. Not an item in all nature has escaped the thorns of Thistle's curse. For a long time, the Jews have been the Antichrist, so-called. Now, drop the word anti-Semitism. That's a hoax of a word. Semites are a large, large segment of people of which the Jews are a small part. Most Arabs are Semites. And there are seven times more Arabs in the world than there are Jews. That's a word of the 19th century coinage to cover up what really is the question. Can a person blame the Jews? Can they blame the Freemasons? The Jews? And the Freemasons sprang from the Knights Templars, the Catholics. The funny part of it is, 
those who were closest to Christ became the worst known antichrists in the world. Now about this thing of the Jews being the antichrist, I want to read to you something from the prophet Ezekiel who wrote these words probably in the year 528 before Christ. He was an antecedent of the Jews, a predecessor of Christ, of the apostles. He was captured and taken prisoner by the Babylonians and lived for 31 years with the Babylonians. And while there as a prisoner, he wrote these lines telling us about the horrible Jews. who are oftentimes called the Antichrist by people who do not understand that Antichrist and his legions change from period to period, from time to time. Today there's no worse Antichrist than the American people. With their legalized abortion, killing approximately a thousand infants every day in New York City and its metropolitan area, and yet screaming about a hundred killed in Vietnam or one killed in Northern Ireland. First time in the history of civilization, pagan or Christian, when murder of infants was not only legalized, but declared a virtue to protect the population. Let the Americans remember that. That ex-Catholic Christ, they're very, very insane. 
qualities of confirmation. You weren't here sent here on this earth to join the church triumphant today or tomorrow. You're placed on this earth, you're placed in the bonds of the Holy Spirit and the army of the Holy Ghost to belong to the church militant, to take up your cross and follow Christ, to get out there fighting, not against people, but against crime, not with the policeman's revolver or baton in your hand, but armed with wisdom, understanding, knowledge, fortitude, and love of God as were the original martyrs. And I cry. My name is Legion. Did we ever think you would hear a priest stand in a Catholic pulpit and say that at this juncture of civilization, the worst battalions of the army of the Antichrist are fallen Catholics? They are today. was Father Coughlin's second sermon at Old St. Mary's, and we move on to his third and last, June 10th, Old St. Mary's, Father Coughlin. Reverend Father Mayor, Holy Ghost Father, ladies and gentlemen, it's one of the rare privileges of my life to be here today. the Holy Ghost Parish and the parish of his blessed spouse. As I was saying here the day before yesterday, I've always felt close to the Holy Ghost Fathers because they assisted me at the shrine. And because I had a long-distance companionship with one of the most brilliant Holy Ghost Fathers, one of the most brilliant priests in all the world since the days of Cardinal Newman, Dennis Fahey. There was only one Dennis Fahey in our generation. Yesterday I had a 15-minute conversation with a group here in the church. The subject of the conversation and discussion was the Antichrist. As you know, there's only one Antichrist. His name is Satan. Probably some here are not too alert to the fact that Antichrist is the world's champion copycat. He tries to imitate everything that Jesus Christ accomplished. If Christ established the church, or rather founded a church, I'll stand corrected, and I've done this intentionally to distinguish the two words later on. If Christ founded a church, if Christ had 12 apostles to be his rulers of the church in the beginning, If Christ insisted that there must be unity in the church, such a type of unity that all the members of this church are united to him and with him in the mystical body of Christ, 
And really, they are the church. They are the body of the church. And he is the head of the church. So Satan operates along the same pattern, following a similar policy. He too has apostles, most of whom are fallen angels, of course. Christ started off with twelve. Probably there are 2,000 in the world today on earth. Satan has at least 2,000, not all angels, of course, by this time. If I can torture the simile a little bit, probably he has a college of cardinals, too. They are still angels. But his bishops today are mostly human beings, such as we are. The main factor about his following the example of Christ in building up his army is the fact that There's a mystical body of Satan. It's more numerous than is the mystical body of Christ, but not so extensive. Christ's mystical body extends to heaven. Satan's mystical body is more or less confined to earth and probably to hell after death. That part is very understandable. We see it all about it. The conflict, the combat between the mystical body of Christ and the mystical body of Satan. Catholic Church tells us that there were many segments of the mystical body of Christ, for example, in the way the religious orders were founded, the early Benedictines, all the way through down to the latest community of men and women that we have. Always something new, always something old, but we are always apt to forget the greatest order in the Catholic Church is the order of the laity, the order of the men and women who have not received holy orders, the order of the men and women who have received the sacrament of confirmation. It's just as important in one sense as is the sacrament of holy orders. You, ladies and gentlemen, are confirmandi. You are ordained to become a special part of the mystical body of Christ. body of Satan, of course, is composed of laity as you are. What laity? In our day, of course, we became accustomed to say that the communists were the mystical body of Satan. Probably, that is correct. But you see, the mystical body of Satan changes from period to period. From age to age, Satan is like Quicksilver. You can't put your finger on him. He scatters. At one time, 
as I remarked yesterday, the mystical body of Satan probably was identified more with the Aryan. The Aryan in the fourth century grew rapidly, grew subversively, until they emerged into what we call the Mohammedans in the seventh century. And you can follow this emergence, this revival of the mystical body of Satan down the ages, down through the Knight Templars, down through the Masonic Lodges, down through the various heresies that intermingle between Arianism and communism today, the worst heresy of all being present with us now, and it's quicksilverish, hard to put your finger on. Now, the great distinction, one of the great distinctions between the mystical body of Christ and the mystical body of Satan is this. Always remember this. The mystical body of Christ has a supernatural concept of life. Life on this earth is a period of probation according to this army of Christ. Life on this earth is a struggle, a combat, an agodistes, as the Greek called it, between a battle of fallen angels and a battle of glorious angels that began so many hundreds of millions of billions years ago that there is no computation. Satan evidently swore, although he was cast into hell, to carry on a destruction against God. Shall I serve God was his question when he was given charge of the firmament? Shall I serve God after it has been my privilege to care for the circuits of the stars and the planets, to put them in their orbits, to guide them through the trackless waste of infinity almost. And he said, non-serviam, I'm just as big as God, I'll care for that myself. And his sin of pride, because he was the chief engineer of the firmament, won for him a place in a new planet he never dreamed would exist, a planet called hell. Oh, hell's a place, don't forget it. Hell's not a pygmy planet as this earth is. Hell has no dimensions in one sense. But it's there. And it's populated by personal beings, each one of whom has far more intelligence, far more potency, that all Americans and all Europeans and all the human beings on earth put together. Don't underestimate an angel. Don't underestimate a fallen angel. You and I, and all men put together, have no competency to confront them. No match. And yet here is this mystical body of Christ. I wonder why Christ preferred to ascend to heaven, preferred to go into exile, as it were, 
or as one of our great bishops 40 years ago said, prefer to go out on bail after the three courts found him guilty of sedition. Of stirring up the multitude. Of being no friend of Caesar's. How could he be a friend of Caesar, the warmonger? How could he be a friend of Caesar, who called himself God, Caesar Augustus? How could he be a friend of Caesar, who exploited the poor? How could he be a friend of Caesar, who regarded womankind as a little better than a pig? How could he be a friend of Caesar, whose whole compound of philosophy was measured by the confines of this pygmy earth, a materialistic concept of life, so that when you died, you went back to the slush pools, to the maggots, with no eternity. But nevertheless, that's the very essence of Antichrist, be he Satan himself, or his mystical body. As I say, one day it could be Arianism, one day Nestorianism, one day the rebellious Catholicity of Luther, another day Deschardinism, another day Marxism, another day communism, and today industrial Americanism, as some of the smart scholars are calling it. Communism is passe and you don't know it. It's not passe in its philosophy. Its philosophy is still the same. A materialistic concept of life. But today we find the industrialists of Europe and of America, we find the politicians of America who fought communism 20 years ago, shaking hands and genuflecting before them today, and they to him. The new Antichrist that's being born in our midst, international industrialism with its own materialistic concept of life with its own godless schools. With its own philosophy of making the middle class keep the poor class and save the rich class from paying taxation. Its own philosophy of lust instead of purity, of sex instead of soul, its own philosophy, which is a compendium of every evil that we've had before it. You see it in your daily life, you read it in your daily paper, and instead of the truth of the Bible, they put pornography in front of you, and damn, smear, and destroy any person who has the courage to defend itself to defend Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you this because I'm interested in you, the members of the mystical body of Christ. I want to insist that you have been called to a vocation higher than baptism gives you. Forget not the story in the Acts of the Apostles when Peter and James and John and Andrew and the rest of them gathered there to hear the story of Samariah, and they heard that those people in Samaritans had been baptized, and aghast they said, but they have not yet received the, the sacrament of confirmation. They've only been baptized with the words of the Scripture, as if saying that's not enough, and it isn't enough. And they sent two of the apostles down there to confirm them. 
to bring them the Holy Spirit in a special ghostly manner. What does the Holy Spirit do at confirmation? That's when you are really inducted into the mystical body of Christ. That's when you get gifts that you get at no university on the face of the earth today, including Catholic University, including Notre Dame University, including Fordham, including Detroit University. They've all abdicated God and the supernatural concept of light, making it a matter of honor to teach heresy and to teach the mystical body of Satanism. Confirmation gives you wisdom, godly wisdom. Gives you understanding so as you can see through the figmentations of this life. It gives you knowledge of a special kind, the knowledge of Christ the knowledge of why the sacraments, the knowledge that of ourselves we are impotent to live the life that Christ had designed for us and that we needed the sacraments and their graces to make a success of our battle. Confirmation. The sacrament, likewise, of fortitude. I'm not going through all of them, but fortitude. Fortitude, the great gift of the Holy Spirit that makes you battlers in deed as well as in name. You know, this earth was never planned to be the church triumphant. That has to wait until you go to heaven. On this earth, you must belong to the church militant or get the hell out of it. That's the right word. Because you are either with me or against me. There is no middle term in this battle between Satan and God between Christ and Antichrist. You're either on hell's side or heaven's side. As a battler, you're supposed to suffer. As a battler, you're supposed to organize because you know in any body, a portion of the body that's separated from the main arterial system soon dies, soon becomes cancerous. Ever since the year 1453, to be precise, with the date, the downfall of Constantinople, the victory of Mohammedanism over Christianity, the victory of the first acceptance of another form of religion. Ever since 1453, the poor Holy Spirit has been relegated to the kitchen sink in the Catholic Church. You'll recognize that Christ isn't here anymore officially, don't you? You said your credo. You said the words. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That's where Christ is. He's not here officially. You know your scripture. You know that before Christ went to heaven, he assembled his apostles said to them when they were lamenting the fact that he was about to leave them, he says, it's expedient for you, gentlemen, that I go, for if I go not, I will not send the Holy Spirit, but if I do go, I will send him to you, and it is he, not me, who will convict the world of sin and justice and judgment. So the paraclete, the Holy Spirit 
this down here, while twice, according to the good words of the great Michael Gallagher, is out on bail. Waiting for a judicial upset after the burglars had assembled those whom Christ had healed and fed and befriended and taught into Pilate's Hall to perjure themselves. After Peter, the designated apostle, said, I know not the man. After all the apostles saved John, ran. They weren't yet apostles. They weren't yet apostles, but designated apostles. They ran. They scuttled away from him. And they left him there to be spat upon, to be done to death after having been lashed to the pillar, crowned with thorns, and forced to walk the streets. For he had befriended a thousand. The coward standing there without a voice raised in his defense while he was being brought to the heights of Calvary's hill, crucified between two robbers and the high priests of religion down below applauding his death as the last drop of blood flowed from his heart. Well, I'm afraid that there are too many Catholics today following their example. But you see, the trial was held. The civil court, the imperial court, and the Jewish high priest court found him guilty of blasphemy, found him guilty of death, found him guilty of stirring up the multitude who needed stirring up, found him guilty of being no friend of Caesar. Poor fellow. He walked those streets and they say that the heavy cross bowed him down to the stones. Oh, that wasn't it. His heart, his human heart was broken because of the ingratitude of those whom he cared for. And they didn't raise a voice. They were afraid of Caesar. They were afraid of public opinion. Christ to be martyred as far as they were concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, since 1453, I say we've been making compromises on the Holy Spirit and on his presence here on earth. Some things we can't compromise about. You can't compromise about as to your identity. You are confirmed. You have taken a step, and if you step out of it, you're worse than those boys who ran off to Canada, Norway, and Holland and wouldn't stand by our government. You're deserters. Rotten deserters. And you can be a deserter by keeping your mouth shut. You can be a deserter by not speaking out when you're contested on a matter of Christian truth. Because you're not supposed to fight with guns and bayonets and missiles and bombs. You're supposed to put on St. Paul's armor, both defensive and offensive, particularly the offensive armor of truth. You're supposed to speak out. You're supposed to realize that you're the temple of the Holy Ghost and have him dwelling in you with fortitude and with knowledge and wisdom and understanding given you at that hour what to say. You can't go wrong. You don't need to be a college graduate. In fact, being a university graduate and 
sociology or even theology in some of our places is a detriment today rather than an asset. But your great university professor is inside you. And until we revive that thought, until we revive the philosophy and the theology that the Holy Ghost is here to vindicate Christ and get him out of bail, it's going to be a sad day for America and the world. This is the new Antichrist. Cowardly Catholics, cowardly Christians. This is the modern Antichrist. Cowardly bishops, cowardly priests, cowardly lay people. This is it. And you're still dreaming about communism that shot its bolt and that's surrendering to the money of the industrialists to the money of the oil barons, to the money of power, to the money of godless schools, godless parliaments, godless hospitals that they've turned into butcher shops. Do you mean to say in Michigan alone they could get by with an abortion if you people stood up and campaigned against abortion? Abortion would fall in a month. If you had fortitude, and that's what you lack. Do you mean to say that in New York City where there are a thousand murders perpetrated every day, infant murders, that Rockefeller could get by with that in a CFR? If the people would rise up. This is the feast day of the Holy Spirit. I wonder how many feast days like this we have to celebrate. The feast day of the consecration of bishops. These apostles were just men and women like you before this day came. Peter was still a coward until five minutes before Pentecost happened. The greatest thing about Peter up to that time was a morning of faith, but he had two good legs he could run fast. But following Pentecost, following the descent of the Holy Spirit, Peter stood his ground. Following that, the dumb fisherman became the wise bishop. So it is with our bishops today. Whether you like it or not, you have to accept your bishops. There are no others in Christ's economy to run the church and to hold the mystical body of Christ together. Whether you like it or not, you have to stand by them. But you can pray for them. You can write to them. You can be genuinely about it and Christian about it. And you can ask your guardian angels to help you. They are the missionaries of the Holy Spirit. And you can ask the Holy Ghost to do something to agitate them. Don't be ungentlemanly. Don't be uncivil. Don't be barbarian in fighting this battle for Jesus Christ. This probably will be my last public appearance. I'm too old to do it again. I'm 82, and I haven't long to go. I know it. But I wish to implore this little group of holy, confirmed devotees of the Holy Spirit to begin a novena in your homes, to make it a perpetual novena, and to remember that he's leading the forces against Antichrist, who has been unchanged. You've read my book on Antichrist. If you haven't, you should do it. When he will be chained again, I don't know. But Christ said this, 
as you will read in the first chapter of St. John. I think it's the first. One day he was standing not too far away from a beautiful garden, and already he had talked to a young man by the name of Simon, and another one by the name of Andrew, and another one by the name of John. And this day he saw at some distance, some 40 or 50 yards away, another young man who took his fancy. He glanced at him, and he beckoned for him to come over. The young man came over. His name was Nathaniel. I don't think that's his right name. I think his right name was Bartholomew, the apostle Bartholomew. But he's called Nathaniel there. And he says, Nathaniel, I knew you when you were standing under that tree over yonder. You were a man of probity. I'm giving it a free translation. Come, I wish to talk to you. And Nathaniel says, you must be the son of God. To know who I am. And he says, one day, Nathaniel, you're going to see strange things happen. You're going to see the heavens opened up and angels coming down upon the Son of Man. Well, it's a long, long time ago, an old Anglican bishop passed this remark to me. He says, you know, you Americans are great for quoting the words, Believing. And see, you say seeing is believing. Well, that's not Christian. Believing is seeing, because if you believe, you'll see the angels coming down. If you believe, you'll conquer. If you believe hard enough, you'll outstrip this Satan. You'll overcome his army, his army of Calcitrant Catholics, they are the worst in it. They are the worst, believe me. There's known as bad in our century as was de Chardin. He was worth Kant and Fichte and Schelling and Hegel and Schopenhauer and Luther all poured together. The damage he did in Holland, the damage he did in France and Belgium and England and even in our convents and monasteries in this country. He hasn't reached the zenith of his notoriety yet. But the point is, get devotion to the Holy Ghost going. Believe hard. You'll see things. He'll let you see things. He'll let you do things. He'll bring something to your mouth to say, something to your heart to love. And this little congregation here today could spread this word over all the United States for a without revival to devotion of the Holy Spirit, which means recognition of the fact, number one, that you belong to the mystical body of Christ, and number two, that you are in the army of the Holy Spirit, the church militant, and number three, that their chief purpose in life is to get Christ off the hook, if I may put it that way. Get him away from merely sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Get him coming down from heaven with the angels to judge us. And to say to his soldiers, sit ye at my right hand. May this blessing of Pentecost descend upon you. And may the gift of the Holy Spirit inflame you to be a brave, courageous Christian. Not afraid to die for Christ. That would be easy for me and for everyone else but not afraid to live for Christ.
which is more important. In this world where our seminaries are empty, when our bishops are frightened, and when our people are in disarray, God bless you. You can win. In the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. This program was produced and distributed by Keep the Faith.